<clears throat> we'll begin by <clears throat> reading <coughs> from Psalm 70 or 24, 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. The Lord is strong and mighty, the Lord will be in the Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. There's an interesting thing in the Old Testament. <clears throat> there is much mystery and intrigue and <clears throat> uh, cliffhangers. From the very beginning, there was a prophecy of one born of the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. But that wasn't the begin. I mean, that wasn't the, the that was the not the that was the beginning, but not the end. And all the way through the Old Testament, there is this rising of of mercy and intrigue and interest to the sense that always there was a shadow or a silhouette of someone standing in the background who was going to set everything right. Um, like a silhouette or a shadow, often it wasn't real distinct or particular. But one of the things you found through the the... The, the people of faith in the Old Testament was there was this longing and hunger for someone to come. You're familiar with uh, Samuel and, and the birth of the little baby. And in, the, um, in Hannah's prayer and thanksgiving, she actually at the end calls for and prays for the coming of the Messiah. The very first time the word Messiah occurs in the Old Testament, it's 1 Samuel 2.10. And all the way through, you just keep seeing these echoes, these, these inclinations, these suggestions, these clues. And here in Psalm 24, it's like <clears throat> the picture is here are these mighty gates of the city open wide in the anticipation of the great king coming. All the kings of the Old Testament, the Davids, the Solomons, and, and the others were but shadows of this great king. And so who is the king of glory? None other than the Lord Himself, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. The interesting thing is, this is a song that, is, that turns our heart to Christ. He is the King of glory. He is the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And the interesting thing is, is the battle is won in two stages. The first, the cross. Second time he will appear without sin to judge the world. But as we gather on this Christmas day, we are, we have the <coughs> excuse me, we have the blessing and the joy of knowing that the mystery is solved, and the one that all history looked forward to was Jesus Christ, the King of Glory. Let's pray, Father. We thank you for this day, and pray that you would bless and encourage us as we gather on the day in which we celebrate the Incarnation, that our hearts would be filled, our minds would be in enriched, and our lives would be overflowing for Your glory and the good of others. Bless every aspect of this service. We do pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you would please stand for the reading of our text from Isaiah chapter 9. I will apologize ahead of time when I start coughing. I feel fine. I just... Something has crawled inside and doesn't want to come out. <laughs> but <clears throat> one of these days. This is the word of God to the people of God. But there will, be a, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who well <clears throat> dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them was light shown. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burnt as fuel for the fire. 
For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and the name shall be called, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And God's people said, Amen. If you would please be seated and we'll again look to the Lord <coughs> in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you <coughs> for this day. For it is a joyous celebration. Something that we rejoice in, but our joy is in no way com commensurate with how great a day it really is. I pray that you would fill us by your Spirit with the joy of this time, with the joy of your Son. Guide and help me to speak your word that draws our attention and focus on you. Bless in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> How many of you remember Christmases when you were a kid? Do any of you remember Christmases? What, what, when you think of Christmas, what did you think of? Songs? As a kid, the gifts. Gifts. I can remember when I was a kid, all the packages were brought out and put under the tree. And I'm, my mom worked at the VA, so she was off working, and I would get the packages out. And I would do everything I could to read through the, the uh, wrapping paper. Okay? Uh, at times, I would actually take a piece of a pencil or something and try to put, you know, look in there to see what, the, what it was. That's basically all I could remember about Christmas. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember food. I just remember a plethora of gifts. Um, and the sad thing is I cannot remember only two gifts that I got over the many years. I remember it was some kind of a rector set, had these little tanks, and you put colored water in it, pumped it. And the other one was I received, and I don't know exactly when, a, a telescope. And I still have that stuck away in the, in the garage, or in the, uh, the attic of my garage. But I mean, if, if you can't think of Christmas without gifts, right? I mean, isn't that part and parcel of it? In fact, the interesting thing is, we have a proclivity to give. What do you do on, on birthdays or anniversaries or special occasions? What do you do? I mean, do, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought, what, what, what is it about gift giving? We're just, it's, it's part and parcel of who we are. And, you know, we like to get gifts and we love to give gifts. Why? One of the things I think we un have to understand is that our giving of gifts, in a sense, is part of the Imago Dei, part of the very nature of God. Uh, remember what Jesus said, it is more blessed to... Do you like to give? Yeah, I mean, you, know, you, you have a loved one. You, you like to give. It's not like someone comes up and grabs you by the arm and just twists you up your arm and... Oh. But the, the people you care for and the people you love, there is just a, a, a pressure to do so. And I think what that comes from is the very nature and makeup of who God is. And we bear that image, we bear that likeness. And what I want to talk about today is the gift of gifts. I want to begin by, for a moment, thinking about what God's like. The Bible pictures God as the giving God. One of the most central words, both in the Old, but especially in the New Testament, is the word grace. It's found everywhere. It's, it saturates its pages. Everywhere you turn, you'll see aspects and thoughts about grace. And it is a very important word. It's become <clears throat> a word of great significance in theology, and rightfully so. But the word grace simply means gift. When you look at the word grace, think gift. <clears throat> God is a giving God. The very nature of God is to give. There is a, a propensity in God, a, a, a pressure, will, to give, to bestow, to overflow. A couple weeks ago, I was reading from a book 
called The Air We Breathe, and it was a comparison, really interesting one, with all the religions of the world in kind of <coughs> a, short a, a short span of pages with Christianity. And one of the things... <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, that the author pointed out was that all the world's gods created man and demanded of man to do something. In fact, uh, many of the gods in their myths said that they created God, or God, the gods created men to serve them, to give them, to provide for them, to do their bidding. And how much of a contrast there is between the gods made up of people and the God who is. The, the thing that is so striking about God in Scripture is that He stands as a God who gives, who bestows, who overflows, who gives of Himself to His creation. <clears throat> and it's not merely something God does but it is part and parcel of who God is. He, it just is His nature. And, and that's, that is itself <coughs> so striking. Um, you might know uh, generous people, right? Well, a, a generous person is nothing compared to the God who is generous. And we'll see that in a moment. A couple of texts, 1 Peter 5.10, refers to God as the God of all grace. The God of all gifts. And in James 1, it says every good and every perfect gift is from above, from the Father. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have been in like a work situation where you have to have a, a gift exchange? Yeah. Do you like doing that? Yeah. No, right? Because it's like you have to at first, what am I going to get for these people, right? And then they have, it's like, you know, it's a white elephant. Is that a el white elephant gift? And they say, okay, it's a certain amount of money, you know. And if you, you know, and then they exchange it. But, it, you know, that's kind of like, right? Now, if you have your kids or somebody you care for, it's easy. But there's kind of like, oh, you know, I don't really want to do this, but I have to because if I don't, well, then, you know. <clears throat> so there are times in which we want to give <coughs> and there are times in which we don't want to give. But God's nature to the very root of who he is is a giving God. A gracious God, a generous God, a lavish God. And to use the uh, old meaning of the word prodigal, a prodigal God in the sense that he gives abundantly. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And the way he dispenses those gifts is amazing. He dispenses it in a, if we could say, in a general goodness to the undeserving. And what I mean by that is, here's God. And he created a universe. He created Adam and Eve. Put them in a wonderful place, a paradise of paradises. Did they deserve to be created? Was there in any way they earned it? No, because they didn't even exist. And then once they did exist, God poured upon them blessing upon blessing. It's the nature of God to be unbelievably generous to people, to things that don't deserve it. Now, that's not a bad thing. You know, it's like you go to work and someone gives you $100,000. Okay, that would be a nice thing, wouldn't it? Did you deserve that $100,000? <laughs> well, good. <laughs> okay, but you know, go get $100,000. I don't deserve it, but it's still a great thing to get it. And there is everything about, everything that flows from God is this good generosity that just permeates everything that God created, everything that God does. You know, it causes, you know, it just, it's amazing. But what is really amazing is what I call the special goodness of God to the ill-deserving. For two chapters, everything in the Bible, things were going okay, weren't they? Just two chapters. <laughs> Chapter three, and it went <laughs> downhill, right? Did God stop being generous? No. And the, and the, the charting of the history of the Bible is God's goodness and God's grace and God's giving to people who deserve the very opposite. God said to Adam and Eve, in the day you eat thereof, you shall what? But they did not surely die. 
And you see, even in God's harsh judgment, goodness. I mentioned, and Patty mentioned, the fact in Genesis 3.15 that he was going to provide a solution immediately after the fall. And you look at the history of Israel. How cantankerous were those people? How, how stiff-necked and hard-hearted were they? Constantly rebellious. Incessantly evil. And yet, what did God do? He provided for them. He gave them. You think of instances like <clears throat> the city of Nineveh. You know, we, we look at the city, we read the book of Jonah, and here's this whole city <coughs> who, by God's grace, in an instant, at, in mass, repented. And God stayed his judgment. But people don't have an idea how bad the Ninevites were. They were a vile, wicked, violent people. Uh, they, were, they scared people. And, and the way they did it is when they conquered a, a, a town or a city, one of the things they would do is they would take the leaders of the city and they would peel them like grapes and they would attach their skin on the outside of the city to demonstrate how serious they were. I mean, it was just, they were a bloody people, a violent people. And yet God was gracious and merciful to the ill-deserving. And that is amazing. You know, it, it, you know, we can give good gifts to people we think deserve it, right? But is it hard for us to give good gifts to people who ill deserve it? Yeah, we, we, we can't even imagine that, can we? We think of the, of the man that, <coughs> or the men involved in those two girls over in Delphi, India, Indiana. Remember that? And they were the horrible thing, just unghastly kind of uh, crime committed. Do we, can we even imagine doing anything good to those people? They don't deserve it, right? But here is the uniqueness of God. There is in God even a, a proclivity, an inclination to do good to people who deserve the opposite. That's the amazing thing. That's the, the, the good news of this. And what we see specifically is that in this <coughs> giving of God His good gifts to people, he gives the ultimate gift, and that is his son. The gift of gifts is his son. Um, in the passage that we read here, it says that the people who were in gloom and darkness, <coughs> they've seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. <coughs> and that passage is actually re referenced in the New Testament because this is a prophecy of Jesus, specifically where Jesus would be, would be ministering. Where was his ministry centered at? Galilee. And this is, the, this is the region described here. But the picture is, here's the darkness, and here's the gloom, and here's the forbearance, and here's everything going wrong. But at a time, God caused the light to shine. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has this light shined. And the text tells us what this light is. We're familiar, everybody knows uh, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be up <coughs> upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is about God. You know, when you're thinking about giving to someone, what do you think? What limits do you place upon yourself? No amount. Okay, in other words, if it's a coworker, you think $20 or less. <laughs> okay? If it's your, 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 your most beloved child, you think what? Or grandchildren, even better. You know, right? What do you think? Huh? No limit. Whatever you can afford, right? Okay, what's the difference? Your love. Huh? The value. Yeah, in other words, to these people, mm, but to these people. Now, I want you to understand something about God. A strange and wonderful thing, God does not give in measure. Unlike any of us. Because... 
if God gave in measure, and we're the kind of people we are, God wouldn't cut it at $20. (laughs) It would be much lower, wouldn't it? There is, as I said, the very nature of God to give and to (coughs) give without measure. He gave his son. (coughs) Now the word in in, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the word son here, at first glance, everybody said, well, that simply means a male heir. Because the king, you know, would sit on the throne of David, would be a king, and he would be a male. But again, take the whole of Scripture, especially the Old Testament setting this up. There is, in this, the, the Puritans used to use this phrase all the time. They would talk of a pregnant phrase or a pregnant idea. And that means it was full and ready to come forth. The phrase here, a son, is not just simply referring to a male heir, but it actually is the, it's like a germ, it's like a, a seed, it's like an egg full of life that will be gradually unfolded. In fact, in uh, Psalm 2, it said, uh, God says, I decree this is my son in whom I have begotten this day. This is not just a male heir. This is something profound and significant that the New Testament will explode and give us clarity of what he's, what he's saying here. Examples of this. In John 3, 16, everybody knows it. <coughs> For God so loved the world that he gave what? <coughs> now, <coughs> originally they thought the root of that word was a certain phrase. More and more of the scholars today think that the word really means not only begotten, but one and only. Absolutely unique. So the picture here in John 3.16 is that God gave his son and his son is in a class, a category that only he's in. There is nothing of greater value to the father than the son. Absolutely none. Um, And two occasions, one in his baptism and the other time (coughs) on the Mount of Transfiguration, the the generally silent father speaks from heaven. Okay? Generally speaking, the father doesn't speak from heaven. Doesn't (coughs) doesn't speak audibly. But on two occasions, it's almost as if he can't help himself. It is almost that he cannot be, he cannot constrain himself. And he declares in both cases, this Jesus, this is my what? Beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what that is actually is the combination of two texts, Psalm 2 and Isaiah 42, where he puts these two together in reference to the son. And here's the son, I mean, here's the father references. I find absolute satisfaction in my son. Complete and total flawlessness. And then in Colossians 3, a beautiful phrase. (coughs) It speaks of the son of his love. It speaks of the son of his love. Now, one of the things (coughs) we need to understand and when we, we talked a little bit about last Sunday about the love of God, the only way God loves is always in the context of His Son. Okay? <clears throat> there is no love of God in the, in the ultimate sense outside of the Son. There cannot be. In fact, that is the defining reality of what love is. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. <coughs> the Son is the love of the Father. It is, he is His delight. And the way, and the only way in which God expresses His love is in and through the Son. And that's why, for example, you will find constantly in the writings of Paul, um, it says, for example, in love He predestined us at to the adoptions of sons. In Christ, 14 times, in, no, 11 times, I think, in those verses, it says in Christ. In John uh, <coughs> 17, as he's praying, he talks about us 
being in the love that the Father has to the Son. So when the Father is expressing His love, it is always and always will be in the terms and context of His Son. Now, there's two ways, two, I call them two dimensions in which God bestows His love. The first dimension for, for His giving is that He gave His Son for us. This is a wondrous and glorious message of the Bible to sinners. In um, two texts, and there could, there's hundreds more, in Romans 4.25 it says, He was delivered up for our trespasses. In 1 Peter 5.18, it says Christ suffered the just for the unjust. The Father gave the Son for us that we might be rescued, saved, forgiven, redeemed, justified, reconciled, delivered from the wrath of God to come. I mean, he was given for that end. For that purpose. <clears throat> and it <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and it's the glorious message of the Bible that God gave his son for us. But the amazing thing, <clears throat> and I pondered this this whole week, actually for longer than a week. I just can't get over what verse six actually says. In verse six it says to us. A child is born. It doesn't say for us a son is given, as in our behalf, but to us. There is a difference. It's a, a, a profound difference between for us and to us. The ultimate dimension of God's giving is the giving of the son. To us. Our common attention is the glorious truth that God gave His Son for our rescue. And, I, and, and we really and rightfully so park on that. That is the proclamation of the gospel. But such a gift is the means for the final gift. He gave His Son to us. Now let that sink in. What's the greatest gift you've ever received or the greatest gift you ever gave <clears throat> is always less than you, isn't it? You've never given all you are. You can't. But here, the shocking, the amazing thing about God is that He gave Himself without measure to us, to the likes of us. I was thinking about it. I was like, what in the world? I mean, you, you scratch your head and you say, what, what's going on here? How can we conceive of such a gift? God just didn't give of himself. God didn't give from himself. God gave himself to us in his son. Could God top that? What more could God give? That's why Paul in, in uh, Ephesians said, such a gift surpasses our ability to comprehend. The devil wants us to picture God as stingy, mean, raw, vindictive, hateful, churlish. When Satan was in the garden, the serpent was in the garden, <clears throat> He wiggled into the mind and heart of Eve so that Eve would doubt God's what? His word, His goodness. And Satan succeeded. And from that point on, Adam and Eve and all of their progeny would question and doubt the goodness of God. God, in a sense, declared to the world that that is a lie. In this gift of his son, 
<coughs> God did not merely, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> give to us <coughs> out of the infinite resources. He gave himself in his son. There's no greater gift than that. There's no greater possibility. There's, what, what, as I said, what more could God give than that he gave his son to us? You know, you could imagine what your greatest gift would be, but it would pale in comparison to the gift God gives. Now, this come kind of responds to what Ben said. The gift must be received. There is, in a sense, <coughs> a universal offer of this gift. I think that's what John 3.16 is saying. There is a universal offer to this gift. Anyone who would take the Son can have the Son. Anyone who would take the Son can have the Son. And throughout the gospel, throughout there, we find <coughs> constantly the necessity of receiving it. I remember <coughs> some time past, it was when I were, <coughs> excuse me, when I worked at Vermilion Gardens, they had a little bit of Christmas gifts passing on. And one of the things they gave were $2 uh, coupons or gift cards from uh, McDonald's. Okay? Well, guess what I have? Still someplace tucked away in a drawer. I got a $2 gift card, right? Why? One, what can you buy at McDonald's for $2? Pardon me? Well, I won't. <laughs> but essentially, <coughs> excuse me, it's practically worthless, isn't it? I, I, you know, and the proof of it is it's tucked away someplace in my vast collection of well-organized stuff. I say that because I look at my wife and she rolls. You know, she goes, you don't know where anything is. I keep protesting I do. But clearly, a $2, if I gave you a $2 gift, coupon from Ronald McDonald you might be oh that's nice you might buy yourself a cup of coffee but it's not real big deal is it it is a big deal okay. well then I'm not going to give you $100,000 I was thinking to give you $100,000 but if you're if you're sad <coughs> but what does the value of the gift demand the greater the value of the gift what the greater the demand right now here's God to this vile and rebellious and wicked world and he said I am going to demonstrate the, 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 the vastness of my love I'm going to give my son and to whomever wants him he will be given but it's interesting when the Bible talks about believing and receiving it's never a request it's a command. For example, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. This is a gift God gives and offers of which he demands people to respond. In the Son, draw a circle. This is, <coughs> this is God giving. In the Son, all, everything, the good pleasures of God outside the Son is ruin. In 1 John 5, He that hath the Son hath, he that hath not the Son of God hath, hath not life. The world is offered the Son. Not merely what the Son will do for them, indeed He will, but God says, I am going to give you, if you receive the Son, the Son Himself. And in fact, I'm giving you Myself. In the Son. There is no greater gift. And there therefore is no greater responsibility to respond to that gift. That's why there is a hell. And it is just. It is right. It is appropriate. Because they have refused the Son. God has, if you will, opened the heart, His infinite heart, to this vile and wicked world and said, This is my Son which I have given to the world. Take my son, believe on my son, entrust 
yourself to my son. Treasure my son. Value my son. And it's all yours. I'm yours. And you're mine. And that's, that's a glorious thing. You know, the whole of the Bible says, I will be your God and you will be my people. It's wonderful. This is, the, this is God and this is God giving. And the, and, the, and the requirement on us is to receive it. Oh, to receive it. It's a wonderful thing. But equally, <coughs> to reject it is fury and damnation. But there is a, an unending nature to this reception. This is where I want to conclude with five things that <coughs> I want you to think about, not just today, <coughs> but in the weeks to come. How should I respond to God giving me His Son? <coughs> the first is continuous thanksgiving. Now, ask yourself this question. When is the last time you thank God for the Son? Not merely thank you that you saved me. Yes, that's a thank you for that Jesus went to the cross. Yes, but when is the last time that you can recall when you got up in the morning or the thought crossed your mind, Father, thank you. Thank you for the Son. What, what more could you give than you gave your Son? Thank you. And I, I thought, man, how, I was thinking, my, how we busy and run through and how those kind of thoughts almost seem to be never popping around. But one of the things I'm going to be praying for all of us is there is a continuous gratitude on our part directed toward the Father for the gift of the Son. The second is a pursuing passion. In Philippians 3, Paul gives a, uh, a biographical sketch of himself. <coughs> and he talks about all of his performances and all of his accomplishments and his pedigree. Man, I'm this, I'm that. You know, and then God came and struck him down on the road to Damascus and everything changed. Things that he once trumpeted in and boasted in and counted on. He says, it's, it's just a bunch of refuge and dung. It's worthless. And then, in contrast, he makes some um, unbelievable things in the passage. <coughs> <coughs> he says in verse 8, that his passion is the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Here's Paul. His accomplishments would triumph over all of ours put together, wouldn't they? Okay? I mean, he did things and suffered things that just put us to shame. But Paul says, I don't care about any of that. The surpassing worth of what? Knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He goes on and said, Oh, that I might gain Christ. And then later, and then in verse 10, he says, That I might know Him. What, what Paul, I think, is saying is, Here's this gift of the Son. I want to go all after Him. I truly want to know Him. I truly want to gain him, not externally or, theologi or theoretical, but in actual experience. I was thinking what it would be like if we shared with each other something we learned of Christ the year to come. Oh, I, this is something, because <clears throat> I remember when I was dating my wife and any and every opportunity I had for someone to inform me something about her, I took in and rejoiced in. I wanted to know her, and I wanted to know her better. Now here's the Apostle Paul says, God the Father gave me his son. My passion is to truly know the son. And it is an ever-growing passion for the person of Jesus Christ. One thing was listening coming in on a sermon, <coughs> and the, the, the gentleman was preaching from Isaiah 9, 6. And he talked about and parked on that Jesus, the Messiah, was <coughs> the Prince of Peace. 
And the, the gist of it was this woman <clears throat> came to him and said, oh, I need peace so desperately. Oh, I just need peace. My whole life is a mess. And, and then the, the, the essence of the message, and often this is Christianity, the essence of the message is here's, here's that Jesus is the dispenser of peace. Okay? You need it, he's got it. And he'll give it to you. And what that does is it devalues the ultimate gift. And that is the Son himself. John 6. They wanted bread. They didn't want the bread of life. And Jesus set the record straight. Now, if we really understand and we have really received Christ the initial reception in faith and belief, there is in us, like Paul, a passion for Christ. To, to, to see and to comprehend His all-surpassing worth. To gain Him above all. To know Him. I've used this illustration before, but there was a, a pastor It was uh, in the 1800s, early 1800s, and he was going to visit he was given the <coughs> name of a woman who was in dire straits. <coughs> she had tuberculosis and she was extremely poor. So he found the location. It was, she was <coughs> up in a, like basically an attic. So he climbed up a bunch of stairs and there she was. There was no heat. It was in winter. There was absolutely no, st one single piece of furniture and in the middle of the room, she was lying there, covered up with a blanket, suffering. And his heart was broken. Absolutely devastated. And he goes over and gets down on his hands and knees and says to the woman, what, what, can, I, what can I do to help you? And between coughs, she said, I have everything. I have Jesus Christ. Now, we have COVID and we've got all sorts of things and we can complain. If everything was taken from us, could we honestly say everything's cool? God has given me his son. What more do I need? Or are we, hmm, Christ plus. One of the things I want us to understand is what God has given us and the right response. The third response. First, there's a continuous thanksgiving. Second, a pursuing passion. Fourth, a glad obedience. In many places, <coughs> John and in 1st John <coughs> we're told there's a connection between love and obedience if you love me this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and commandments are not burdensome a true response to this gift is not some superficial compliance to his rules but a loving embrace of what he tells us really the right response is not to say, I will, I will curtail what I want for what you want. But a true response is, what you want is what I want. That's real obedience. That's why the psalmist says, oh, how love I thy law. The true heart of God, the heart of glad obedience, isn't, isn't trying to, f my will against his will, the real heart of obedience is I want my will to align with his will. Thirdly, a joyful rest, a contentment. The early church shocked the world because they were sent to the Colosseum and all sorts of sufferings and difficulties and dangers and they could not be quenched or quieted. There was a contentment. It was a joy. Remember Stephen, the first martyr? They were pelting him with rocks. And these weren't little things. <coughs> when they stoned somebody, uh, the, men of this, who, the men who were stoning it would pick the largest rock they could give above their heads that they could hurl with force down. Now, can you imagine that? And these rocks are coming. And if they wouldn't hit you in the head first, they'd hit you in the arm or the leg. And what would happen? They'd break. Okay? And would, what would you do if somebody was throwing rocks at you like that and you had done nothing wrong?
You might say a few choice words back to him, wouldn't you? But what did Stephen do? Pardon me? Prayed for them. He prayed for them? Looked up into heaven? What did he see? Jesus. He saw Jesus standing. There was an absolute rest, even in his own death, at the, at the reality of Christ. And the last thing is an eager expectation of his return. If we really have a passionate pursuit of Christ and a joyful resting, there will be an eager expectation of his return. Maranatha, Lord, come. This coming year, I'm going to do a lot kind of emphasis and stress this more and often and on, is that God has given to you his son. And that is an unbelievable, unsurpassing gift that requires of us to embrace it, no, to embrace him, to take him, to love him, to treasure him. This year I want, this coming year, I want it to be a year in which truly Christ is seen and favored and shared. And today, if you have a few moments, let it sink in to you God gave his son his beloved son his one and only son the son of his love there is no greater love there's no greater gift that God can give than that our response should be commensurate with it let's pray Father in heaven um There's no words that I could put together or fashion that in any measure would give weight and substance appropriate to the gift you gave us. Oh, you could give us the cattle on a thousand hills. You could give us the gold in every mountain, the diamonds <clears throat> in the universe. And we could just relish in the earthly treasures. But when you determined to give the likes of us a gift, you didn't hold back. To us, you gave your son. And I pray, Father, that that would be upon our hearts and our minds, not just today, but this year to come, and not just that, but it would in fact shape, form, and guide how we live the coming year with continuous joy, with a pursuing passion, with a glad obedience, a joyful resting, and an eager expectation that we would come to the full enjoyment of that gift, your Son. Bless and guide to that end in Christ's name. Amen.